Okay. Cool. So hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is part six of our Tools to Engage webinar series, Engaging Constituents, Addressing Root Causes, Food Banks, and Beyond. Um, for those who are new to the series, uh, this is a series we, that we at the Building Movement Project have been hosting for the last year and a half, really looking to lift up the work that service providers are doing across the country to engage constituents in systems change activities and strategies. So we're really excited to have you all with us today. For folks who are just calling in, you are on listen-only mode, so we can't hear or see you. Um, but you should feel free to use that chat function to submit any questions or comments that you have throughout the course of the webinar. And then we'll have a specific Q&A section towards the end of our hour together. Um, and I know folks are always wondering about jumping off early. That's no problem. We will share a recording of the webinar as well as a PDF of the slides with everyone who registered. So no worries if you have to leave us early. Okie dokie, so let's get started. Advance here. Okay, so just a little bit of today's agenda, what you can expect over the next hour. We're gonna start with some quick introductions so you have a sense of who we are. I'm really excited to be joined by my colleagues, Randy and Lindsay from the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, as well as Alicia Swords, who comes to us from Ithaca College. And Alicia's gonna start out with a little bit of a, a grounding in a framework of the movement to end poverty. And she's bringing her experience working with the University of the Poor and the Poor People's Campaign to do some of that grounding uh, and framing for us. And then Lindsay and Randy are going to talk a little bit about the speakers, speakers Bureau they've got going on at the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, some of those practical tips and insights, as well as some of the challenges and the lessons learned, and then the resulting changes. Um, and then again, we'll have a time for questions and answers towards the end of our hour together, but you should feel free to submit them through the chat function as they occur to you. We'll stack them up, uh, and then we'll leave you with a few additional resources at the end. So I'd love to turn it over to my colleagues to introduce themselves. Randy, you wanna start us out? Sure, hi everybody. I'm really excited to present to you all on this topic. Uh, I'm Randy Quack, I'm the Director of Community Impact here at the Food Bank. I've been with the Food Bank for about five and a half years and just prior to coming here, I was just finishing a master's degree in international development studies. I've always really been interested in looking at participation in um, any sort of development effort in my master's thesis actually fo focused on participation in gender and development. Um, I lived abroad for a few years and in the course of my studies, I really learned about bottoms up grassroots engaged community led solutions, you know, a lot of buzzwords we hear about, especially in international development. And I never imagined I would end up working at a food bank. I was obviously hoping to work in an international setting, but as I progressed through my studies, I really learned that I could even be perpetuating part of that problem of showing up to a, a country or a community that I wasn't my own and say, I'm here to help you or fix you. Uh, so I came back to the US to kind of apply some of that theory. Um, yeah, and it's interesting here in the US because we're so focused more on human services and kind of short term uh, solutions and not really long-term engagement uh, to kind of craft solutions together. So that's kind of where I, I come from approaching this work. And I'm Lindsay Lyman. I'm the Advocacy and Education Manager at the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. I've been here about five years as well. I started just after Randy. And I got into this line of work because I was one of the millions of Americans who was fooled into thinking that uh, my family's struggles were, you know, entirely our own fault um, growing up, um, as opposed to a result of a system that is actually designed to create poverty or, um, you know, financial um, struggles for folks, which is what we have. So I, I studied sociology at Ithaca College, where I met Alicia Swords, um, and I got connected with a network of poor people's organizations that we are going to reference throughout um, this presentation, including the Poverty Initiative, the Cairo Center, and the University of the Poor. And these connections and the things I learned from the individuals in these organizations really helped me hone in my own analysis of root causes of poverty and the kind of work I want to be doing. Um, so throughout my time at the food bank, that mentorship that I've received from folks in these organizations like Willie Baptist and other folks that you'll hear us mention um, have continued to inform my work at the food bank and the influence I bring to the organization. One of my key roles is to manage the speakers bureau currently and Randy is my supervisor. My name is Alicia Swords. 
really happy to be with you all. For two decades now, I've been part of a network of organizations that's committed to building a movement to end poverty, led by the poor across color lines. I've been a poverty scholar with the Poverty Initiative at Union Theological Seminary. I'm on the staff of the University of the Poor, and I'm on the editorial board of the University of the Poor Journal. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Ithaca College and direct the honors program there. And since about 2010, I've worked with the Food Bank of the Southern Tier to connect with and collaborate with organizations representing the 140 million poor people across the United States. Great, thank you all. I'm just so grateful to have you with us today and for your time and expertise. Um, so I'm Noelia Mann, I work with the Building Movement Project. We're your host for today's webinar as well as the whole Tools to Engage webinar series. And just so you have a sense of who we are, we're a national research organization. We're based in New York City. And we do work to really push and challenge the nonprofit sector to align its principles and its practices. And we do that by focusing on three main areas. The first is leadership. And there we really look at the nonprofit racial leadership gap, so the barriers to leadership facing people of color within the nonprofit sector. The second area is service and social change, which is all about building the capacity of service providers to lift up the voice and power of the people they serve. And the tools to engage work is presented in that area. And then uh, the third focus area is movement building, and that's all about looking at how organizations work together to have more impact than they would on their own. Um, and just to offer some grounding from BMP's sort of organizational standpoint that roots this service and social change work. Um, so we first and foremost believe that communities need and deserve services that meet their needs because we all rely on services in one way or the other. We also know that service provision alone isn't enough to address the root causes of systemic barriers that communities face. So we really want to encourage groups to go beyond individual responsibility and really look at the root causes of the problems their clients are facing. So we believe one important way to address root causes is by integrating policy advocacy and other systems change activities with the individual advocacy that service providers are already doing. And because service providers are already doing that individual advocacy, we know that they have a really deep knowledge of the systemic barriers that communities face. And we know that service organizations have unparalleled reach into impacted communities. So this means that service providers and service organizations are really uniquely positioned to be powerful agents of change, but they can't be change agents all on their own because underlying all of these ideas is the strong belief that those closest to problems should be closest to the power. And alrighty. So now I wanna turn it over with some of that grounding and framing to get us started pass it over to Randy and to Lindsay to tell us a little bit about the food bank and sort of kick us off here. Great, thank you. Um, just a little bit of information about our organization. So we're obviously the food bank of the Southern Tier. We are one of 200 Feeding America member food banks. We are located in upstate New York, just north of Pennsylvania. You can see there on the map. We cover six counties, mostly rural. It's about 4,000 square miles. Our largest city in those six counties is actually the booming metropolis of Binghamton, New York, if anybody is familiar with the area. We also have Ithaca and Corning our, and Elmira, the other large communities. Um, again, mostly rural, all sorts of different challenges we're being faced with, and we've been in operation since 1981. In addition to being a member of Feeding America, we're also part of the Catholic Charities umbrella. So I think we're one of five or six food banks in the country that's also part of Catholic Charities. I'm gonna to touch on that in a little bit, why sometimes that is a, is a helpful uh, place for us when we're thinking about root causes. And our mission statement is working together to build and sustain hunger-free communities throughout the Southern Tier. And when I talk about our mission statement, I always like to point out the word sustain. So for folks who are familiar with the food banking model, we are sourcing donations and purchasing food from all over the country that we centralize and then shoot out through a network of partner agencies to kind of meet that immediate need in our communities and people get about a three day supply worth, worth of food when they visit one of our programs. And even if we got to the point where we had endless resources and fundings to get as much food out to every little pocket that we needed, that's not really a sustainable model. So something I like to think about is it's actually in our mission statement to be to challenge us to think what does it actually mean to build and sustain a hunger-free community? That means it's it, that we've ended hunger and that we don't need to exist anymore. Um, 
when I came on board with at the food bank in 2013, one thing, you know, I talked a little bit about my background in international development is I, I came in and I'm walking around our warehouse and thinking like, where does this food go? Like, and, and the end, who's the end user? Who's actually eating all this food in our warehouse? And at the same time, we would get a lot of requests from community organizations and partners to say, hey, do you have somebody that visits one of your agencies that would be willing to come and share their story or talk to the media, speak to our group? And I really just started to have this sense that even though we've been around for 35, 36 years, we do not have any relationships really with, with people that are accessing our programs. So that's just kind of where my brain was at when I was starting. And at the same time, um, I'm going to kick it over to Alicia. When Lindsay and I both started here, we were becoming more connected to different individuals and organizations that were actually looking as hunger, at hunger as a, a symptom of poverty and poverty as a systemic issue. So now Alicia is going to speak a little bit more about that collaboration. Yeah, so my task is to explain how the Food Bank of the Southern Tier built a relationship with the movement to end poverty and to tell a little bit about the history of that movement. The movement to end poverty becomes the framework for the Food Bank of the Southern Tier's innovative work. In the last years of his life, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called for and began to build a poor people's campaign. He recognized that ending what he called the triple evils of racism, militarism, and poverty, and today we add ecological devastation, would require a movement that would unite the poor across color lines. This image, these images, well, the photo is a snapshot of the multiracial movement that King and his fellow organizers were building at the time of his assassination. In the decades since his death and the end of the original Poor People's Campaign, a lineage of organizations led by the poor have continued his work and today are calling to reignite his campaign. Those organizations include the National Union of the Homeless, the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And the next slide uh, continues with, uh, sorry, I have to catch up. Today, the Poverty Initiative of the Kairos Center at Union Theological Seminary and the University of the Poor take up this call and continue this lineage of building a movement to end poverty, acknowledging that we have 140 million poor people in this country with little or nothing to lose. I got to know the Poverty Initiative and the University of the Poor as a graduate student, and just after graduating with my PhD, doing what I thought was supposed to make me successful and uh, prevent being in poverty, I became poor myself and struggled to pay for a health crisis as an adjunct professor. As I learned, this movement had to be led by the poor and it needed to recruit from all ranks of society. Since then, I've worked to connect organizations in the Southern tier of New York State with organizations around the country and around the world that are working to unite the poor in a movement to end poverty. Natasha Thompson, the Food Bank of the Southern Tier's president and CEO, met Willie Baptist and other national leaders of this movement on the Poverty Initiative's Pedagogy of the Poor book tour in 2010. And if you don't know that book, it's, it's among the resources we recommend um, on this slide and later you see some additional resources. After meeting Natasha Thompson, Willie Baptist shared his vision of a food bank as a potential survival project. The term survival project comes from the Black Panthers and means an effort that both develops leadership and helps people get involved in a movement while meeting direct material needs at the same time. So I work to help Natasha begin to learn about and connect, get connected with this network. Natasha found the analysis of the movement to end poverty to be in alignment with her values and vision and she worked on hiring Randy and Lindsay in, and others in order to build this vision of a food bank as a part of a bigger movement based on the analysis that poverty is at the root cause of hunger. In 2013, the Food Bank of the Southern Tier hosted a poverty immersion program in collaboration with the Poverty Initiative and included a workshop by the Poverty Initiative in their annual uh, agency conference workshop. 
The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is built on the lineage that's coming out of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign, the National Union of the Homeless, the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, and now the Poverty Initiative. On the left, you can see the March on Washington in June 2018, and on the right, a series of truth commissions, actually back one slide, Noelia, sorry, um, a series of truth commissions that gathered experiences and data from people struggling in our state. This slide seems to have disappeared upon us. I don't know how it has happened. It will definitely be in the PDF that everyone gets. It's a beautiful image of uh, folks marching along with the Poor People's Campaign. So Alicia, my apologies, just continue and we'll, we'll get this slide out to everybody. Sounds great. Um, so I actually was describing the photos to you as well. So, um, so the, the, uh, on the right is a series of truth commissions that gathered experiences and data from people struggling in our state. And below that, a photo of a mass meeting launching the Poor People's Campaign in New York State in October 2017. Today, the Poor People's Campaign is in 40 states, engaged in the largest sustained wave of civil disobedience in this country's history. It has just convened a Poor People's Congress with a thousand delegates from across the country. And the Food Bank of the Southern Tier has been part of the campaign, demonstrating the possibility that a food bank can shift from a charity model to incorporating a root cause analysis. The Speakers Bureau of the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, which you're about to hear more about, represents an organizing process with political education at the center to help people move from understanding hunger and food insecurity and the immediate issues that affect them to understanding the root causes and the need for a social movement to address them. So now I will hand it over to Randy um, to explain yeah. how the Food Bank has taken up this work. Thank you. So um, when Lindsay and I joined the, the organization around the same time, I feel like it was kind of a, a convergence of all these connections, you know, are both both of our backgrounds, the vision of our boss, president, and CEO, the connections with Alicia, and all the all these um, various actors in the Poor People's Campaign and the Poverty Initiative. So we really were kind of set up from the beginning of our time here to think about what is our own in, internal analysis. So as you see on the slide, we've really come to obviously agree that poverty is systemic. And there's kind of three uh, principles that we've been using when we think about in our, like our Poverty 101 wor workshop and when we're trying to educate people on root causes that inequality is growing. I think that's obvious for a lot of people. Ownership is concentrating, that also really resonates with people. And jobs are being eliminated and we know it's either through cons uh, technology, globalization, all of these three things, I don't think anybody can argue with any of those three points, even wherever you're coming from in terms of like why you believe people are poor. And we really know that we can't just end this through charity, charitable programs. We really need a, mo a movement that is led by people that are, are, are living this every day. And that right now, a huge piece of building that movement is identifying and cultivating leaders. And I just love the fight poverty, not the poor, because you know this is the United States and sometimes it feels like we're actually fighting people and not the problem. So now I'm gonna talk about some nuts and bolts of what the actual Speakers Bureau project is here. And my first slide is a use, useful visual for us. So I mentioned our affiliation with Catholic Charities and I was raised Catholic. I never learned about this in Sunday school. I wish I'd had. I probably would have been way more into it. Um, but the two feet of Catholic social teaching has for me and I think for others been a really great visual representation of what, what's possible in our work. And I think the survival project that Alicia mentioned is, is similar. So most nonprofits and food banks, we've been, I always say we're hopping on one foot. We've been hopping on that charitable foot for a really long time. And the charity foot represents addressing the short-term need, you know, making sure people have clothing and food and housing. And that's, it's, in, it's important work. And I think sometimes we get into conversations around there's like a false choice between these two feet, but I think they really have to work in tandem with each other. One thing that we as an organization and maybe many other food banks haven't been so good at is thinking about the justice foot, which is actually looking at root causes, long-term solutions, and actually eliminating whatever we're trying to address. So I just like to ground us with that, and sometimes it gives me some backup when we get into conversations about what, why is the food bank doing advocacy or, you know, working on all these issues, aren't you just here to get food out every day? And 
I can point to this and I can also point to our mission statement. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. A second framework that's been useful, which is not totally perfect, is um, what is called as collective impact. So this is obviously a huge buzzword in a lot of communities, especially around here. And uh, my, my boss, Natasha, and I went to this summit in Toronto in 2014, I think. That was a week-long conference on how do you actually do real community engagement, community change work. And traditionally, a lot of times for uh, service providers or whoever's trying to address an issue, they will we'll start with who we, what we call the content experts. So it's folks who have never actually experienced whatever issue they're trying to address. And these kind of folks can sit around a table and come up with a plan. They say, I see this problem and I've got an Uh oh, looks like we lost Randy. Yep. Thanks, folks. Let it, folks are letting us know that Randy and Lindsay have cut out some Wi Fi issues. We will see if they can call in and join us. They're, they're back. Awesome. Randy and Lindsay, we lost you for a moment. Okay. It did say we were unstable. What was the last thing I said? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think the last thing we heard was you were telling us about um, being in Toronto with Natasha and sort of what went down at that conference. Okay, so sorry if I'm repeating myself. Um, yeah, so a lot of times how decisions are made in a traditional framework is that we have content experts, you know, people, maybe people who haven't been directly impacted by an issue, maybe they have degrees. Um, who sit around a table and say, you know, there's a problem in our community or our state or country, we need to make a plan and this is what we should do. And then we take it out and we pitch it to the people most expect, uh, most impacted and say, hey, what do you think about this? You should buy into my idea. And at this, um, this summit and what the Collective Impact Framework talks about is how do you actually bring both types of experts to the table together and create a plan and make decisions as a group and, um, Sorry, I just was looking at the chat. Um, yeah, like, yeah, this obviously, this like to me makes total sense. Like this is common sense to me. And we're at this week long conference and I'm like, you have to have half the people at the table directly impacted by whatever issue you're addressing. I'm like, yes, this, is, this makes a lot of sense. Well, how do you actually begin that process? And it, it really comes down to who do we have relationships with? Who do, who, 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 where do we have trust? And um, at this, so it's this week-long conference, all these workshops. There was one woman there who actually had some of the answers. And there was a woman named Celeste Licorice who was in Hamilton, Ontario, who had started a speakers bureau for their anti-poverty roundtable. And she had created this program where she trained community members who were living in poverty on how to um, be their own advocates, how to do public speaking, how to become a part of the anti-poverty roundtable initiative that they had going on. And she had this workshop at the conference and I went to it and I was like, you're like one of the only people actually talking about giving some nuts and bolts. So I walked away from this saying, I really want to try this in the Southern tier as a tool to begin to develop relationships to bring different types of experts together. But the first thing we really had to do was go out and start talking to people. So we could go to the next slide. So in 2015, Lindsay and I, you know, we've been talking about this for like a year, a year and a half. I'm like, we need to go out, we need to start talking to people, we need to start forming relationships, we need to have more engagement with the people that eat all this food in our warehouse. So we, we went through this process, of our strategic planning process, where we went out and held a series of eight focus groups throughout our eight county, or six counties, and just, just to start conversations and so we had these two hour sessions at the agency where, where the folks were coming to get food and we literally just shut the door and we just started to listen. And we started with like, a, a, I don't know, 30, 40 questions that we got from other food banks that had done focus groups. And we actually consulted with Alicia and other people connected to the Poor People's Campaign to help us think about what are the questions we're actually trying to get to. And we narrowed it down to three questions from these 30 that were really like, do you receive SNAP, blah, 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 to 
what is the economic situation like in your household? How has it changed over the past few years? And what do you want decision makers to know about your life? And just that first question alone opened up like an hour of conversation for people. People started talking about disability, mental illness, addiction, um, domestic violence, all this stuff came out just when you asked what's the economic situation in your household. So it just really showed to us like we barely actually talked about food in these sessions. All this other stuff was coming up. At the same time, every one of these eight sessions, we people said, when, do, when can we meet again? This was amazing. I've never, I felt like I was so alone. I just felt so connected to people. I see my experience in yours and we wanna get back together. And this was kind of like a first warning sign for us to be like, what's this, like what, what can we actually do that's a sustainable thing to bring people together? So I, we'd had these conversations. I was thinking about the Speakers Bureau project in the back of my brain and I said, let's just try this with one of these groups. So there was a, one particular focus group that was super impactful. It was with a really strong uh, partner agencies of ours. So I went to them and I said, I'd really like to start this kind of program, training program. It's around public speaking and storytelling, I think. Um, can we do it at your agency? And they said, yes. And so I put together a curriculum and just tried it out back in 2016. Before we move on, Randy, would you mind repeating what those three questions were? I think folks just wanted to make sure they, they caught the three questions you asked. Yep, and Alicia just put it in the chat, but what is the economic situation okay. like in your household? How has it changed over the past few years? And what do you want decision makers to know about your life or your experience? Great, thank you. You're welcome. So this is the current Speakers Bureau curriculum that we've been offering. Um, it's really started out as a public speaking program. We wanted people to be able to go out and share their stories and educate the public. It's, and it's, it's really evolved. It's really become much more than that. And Lindsay will talk more about that. So I created this curriculum. The ones in bold are, are, have been additions um, based on what we've been learning. And I was like, let's just try it. And I put out an application and we recruited through the pantry and we had, I think, 12 people, 15 people apply. We had 10 show up to the first session and then we had six who actually graduated. We got every week for eight weeks, the first session. Now we're up to, was it 10? I don't even know. Eight, between eight and 10 weeks. <laughs> we had two and a half hour sessions located right in the pantry or community center. We would offer a $10 gift card. We would offer always have food, transportation assistance, and help people if they were um, if they needed childcare, help to connect them with resources. Um, so we would do a storytelling circle always on our second session. We literally just sit in a, a circle and have a prompt and go around. The public speaking, and I think there's the animation's going to pop up. This was the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This was kind of this serendipitous moment where I was like, I had this in my brain and I was at a 5K event for work and I had gone to a couple Toastmasters clubs and my coworker was a Toastmaster and her uh, club president was at the 5K and she's like, Randy, you should really get back into Toastmasters and this light bulb went above my head and I'm like, they are everywhere. They're the public speaking folks. Like they, so if, you, if anybody on the call is not familiar, they exist pretty much in every country and community and they there's clubs where you can enroll and improve your own public speaking. And we've utilized their speech craft curriculum, which I think is almost magical in how it helps people prepare for public speaking. We had, um, this also came up from the first session. We had a couple people were talking to me about different products that they were getting at their pantry and in particular produce. And I really realized they didn't understand how the emergency food system works. So we actually brought them to the food bank and did a field trip. We took them on a tour of the building. We did a food banking 101 presentation with our boss and um, fed them lunch. And that was amazing just to see them walk through and be like, I know that product. I get that from your mobile pantry. Like just have them see the back end of it. We've always done a poverty 101 workshop, but we've added a bit more about the economy. We do our advocacy training. And then these other three, three that um, Lindsay will talk a bit more that we've added, asset mapping, narrative change, and working with media. And then all these events culminate with a big graduation. We actually just had our third graduation last night, so we're a little tired, but and that's where they give up and uh, give their speeches for their first time in front of friends, friends and family. And it, it's, it's just such a great event. So I can go to the next slide. So I didn't even know if this was gonna work. We tried it, 
these women, it was all women for the first two groups. They graduated, they had these new skills, they had all these ideas, they realized they had a voice, they realized they had a lot to say, and then we're like, well, now what do we do? And I didn't really know if it was gonna, if we're gonna get anywhere to start with. So this is just a couple examples of how people in the, in the graduates have been engaged. And the photo on the top left there is one of our graduates, Jackie, and she's speaking at the Binghamton Poor People's Campaign launch in 2017 that Alicia mentioned, and Reverend Barber was there. A couple of the other photos you can see is just speaking, the bottom left is speaking to a food pantry coalition at their annual luncheon. The top right, um, the, the woman with the, the man in the suit there, that's one of our graduates meeting with her state senator at our food bank lobby day and our state capitol, Albany. The photo to the left of that are some of the women who've been speaking at different poverty simulations. And on the bottom right is, um, we did a press conference on the farm to food bank bill and one of our graduates shared her story about how access to fresh produce pretty much saved her life. And she ended up being the face of that event and she was on the front of the paper and our poor assemblyman's not even in the photo <laughs> that was having the event and this really just showed there was an audience for people and that when folks who are actually directly impacted by food insecurity shared their stories that's really what the public and the media zeroed in on and wanted to share however we really started to see so we had these two groups and we're like we're going to put you on our website we're going to be kind of like your middleman or your agent and connect you to various opportunities and however we we had we started to see um, more of the issues of sustainability there you know we couldn't keep people busy all of the time and one woman said one day i've been waiting by the phone for weeks and i haven't heard from you and we're like oh my god like we've built people up and then they want to go out and we can't like offer them as many opportunities as they would like and at the same time lindsay was it came into this new role and was working with the existing graduates so um, this is a good segue to pass over to Lindsay when, for, for her perspective of when she came on and some of the challenges um, we were facing and the lessons learned and the changes that she's made. Yeah, so I'll just go through some of the challenges we faced here and then the, the lessons learned and changes that we made because of those. So first and foremost, when I came into the role of managing the Speakers Bureau after the first two cohorts had um, graduated, a key challenge that we noticed was uh, graduates of the program looking to us for direction um, and really not making a move without us saying, you know, go left or whatever it would be. Um, so we continued to make changes that reflect that being a leader means to develop other leaders. And um, we knew that we needed to connect folks with folks in the program with leaders in the community aside from ourselves so that they had many people to look to for opportunities to be engaged um, and so in our most recent cohort that just graduated last night this looks one of the ways that we did this was um, just having a job sign up so who's going to come early and help us set up who's going to help us tear down who's going to bring a dish to pass things like that help people feel a bit more ownership and feel like oh we could do this even with Randy and Lindsay weren't here to you know get us together um, so that was kind of one of the changes we made there and then the second one was um, finding the right partner for hosting and, and we really didn't face this until this year. Um, we knew from focus groups that one of the most important aspects initially of setting this kind of thing up is the partner agency that we work with. That's actually very important because they're doing a lot of the recruiting for us, again, because we don't have those relationships on the ground already. And so far, we've really scored the jackpot with the first two that we um, had worked with. And... Um, this past winter, we had planned to run a speakers bureau training in a different location than we ended up because um, there happened to be a funder at this first location we considered. And then we were reminded so much of the importance of those relationships when those folks only came up with two applications <laughs> um, after weeks of um, scrounging for them. And so we changed course at the last minute, which was a little scary, but we um, went where the energy was and it paid off. Um, and we have set, since been thinking, um, reflecting on that experience and noticing how important it is to screen potential partners or host agencies for like, how do they think about poverty and what's their analysis of the problem and also the depth of their relationship with the clients. Because again, we thought that depth was there in this other um, location and it turned out to not be. 
A third is that uh, there's a lot of great perspectives and tools out there um, that we could consider bringing in as resources in this work. And we uh, have found ourselves needing to ask who's funding these resources that we might consider um, and what is their goal, the person that has created it, um, what do they want us to believe, what's their analysis, what would they like us to do. Um, and so we know for our, for us and our analysis that there are two critical criteria, kind of minimum, bare minimum things that we want to be thinking about. One, do the po people that created this resource believe that poverty can be ended and not just ameliorated? And two, do they believe that poor people have power and knowledge and can organize themselves? Because those are kind of two um, key things that can tell us a lot more about where they're coming from. And we know that there can be tensions between a nonprofit's goals for a project like this and movement goals, and we want to stay more towards that movement end of things. Um, and then a few more challenges here. So in general, one of my biggest lessons learned as I've been in this role the last year and a half, close to two years, is that it takes a lot of mental and emotional energy to build relationships like this and to do this work really well. Um, so some of the things that we've brought in to help with that are we've learned about trauma-informed care, um, which if you haven't heard of it, a simple Google search will bring up a million resources on it, um, and ACEs, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And so using trauma-informed care principles has helped set boundaries that kind of help keep me sane or us sane as facilitators of this process. And it also puts it on the group to create a safe space collectively where um, folks feel like they can, again, be owning the process a bit more. And we've also found that it's really important to build a support team around the people or the person who is leading this work. So Randy came to almost all of the sessions with me um, this spring, um, and then we debriefed and we thought about people and we tried to see where folks were at and plan from there. Um, so that's really critical for the long-term sustainability of a program like this. Um, and then another one was that we found after graduation when we started to um, bring graduates out into the community a bit more um, if they hadn't already been out and meet with service providers potentially at you know a more traditional nonprofit type of meeting we would end up with worlds colliding um, folks with lived experience um, you know if they haven't been in that realm before we found that a lot of people hadn't been asked about their experiences or given an opportunity to talk about how services or programs were working for them and so when you have that coming up against the fact that as service providers, we're often pouring a lot of ourselves into our work where we sincerely feel we're doing the right thing. Um, when folks with lived experience would come into that formal space and provide critiques, it would feel like a personal attack on the service provider potentially, um, rather than what it really is, which is a critique of this whole system. And so we kind of found that we needed to anticipate that and head that off a little bit and maybe prepare folks for that possibility and to just try to listen um, with an open mind. And lastly, this is a really big one, um, internalized oppression. So um, we've found that this is just something that is really strong that needs to be overcome in this entire work of building movement and identifying leaders. Um, and in our country, it, it looks like, you know, individualism, um, the bootstrap model, relying on your on yourself and not uh, needing to ask for help and all those sorts of things. It's something that each of us experiences and so each of us needs to work on it. And we learned that it's really important to start political and popular education early on and to not necessarily be shy about the messages that we're trying to get across and um, to be very particular about the false narratives we're not going to um, be um, moving forward, you know, in the Speaker's Bureau. And we also found that one of the best ways to fight internalized oppression is actually through one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we have a graduate from the first cohort, actually, who I had a conversation with um, that I haven't forgotten since then. She said, it was my fault that I kept having kids. I knew I couldn't afford them, and I just kept having kids. And she didn't have that many kids. I think it's like three or four. It's not like a dozen. Um, but she was blaming herself than saying, you know, I just kept, I kept doing this and I was irresponsible. And there's another person in the, um, uh, 
in the, that same cohort who said, who will often say, don't judge me for the decisions I've made if you don't know the choices I had at that time. And so um, we can use those critiques that people have of themselves in themselves to say like, well, let's look at this in the broader picture of what's going on economically, socially, you know, what resources you had. And in order to advance this particular change, we um, have been doing some education, piloting some education with the management team over the course of the last year, year and a half, which kind of served as a testing ground um, for rolling out our more structural analysis here with some of our education. Um, so we've been able to talk about the economy with our management team and the Speakers Bureau, um, those three key um, principles or key um, factors that are happening in the economy that Randy mentioned earlier on. And then we've also done the racial wealth gap simulation, which I know has been featured on this webinar before from Bread for the World. And we've gotten some narrative um, analysis, narrative change resources from an organization called Center for Story-Based Strategy, um, which we used with the management team and also built into our speech feedback time. So the traditional Toastmasters model, which we did for the first two cohorts, is to count things like ums and ahs, you know, how many times did you say that in your speech, to go for um, how long did it take, we time it, things like that. And that's really important for public speaking. And th this time we were able to figure out, oh, we should add in some narrative analysis as we go and um, look at, you know, okay, in Randy's speech, what kinds of myths or narratives about poverty or people who um, are having substance abuse issues or whatever the, the issue is, um, did she bring up? And then how did she contradict that myth um, in order to, um, you know, show that there's actually a very different story that is, is reality. So I think that's one of the most exciting developments from our public speaking focus to leadership development, social change analysis focus that we've been able to make like in the course of the actual training. Um, and then so just to kind of um, wrap up this, like what the changes have been like and why they've been happening kind of thing, we really are continuing to develop our internal analysis um, as we go here and to try to spread it throughout the organization. As Alicia mentioned earlier, um, our analysis of why poverty exists and how it needs to be solved really does stem from this lineage of poor people's organizations that we mentioned up at the top, um, which really you know, harkens back to King's original poor people's campaign that he um, worked on in the years leading up to his death. And exactly one year before he was assassinated, he said in his speech at the Riverside Church, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth and say, that is not just. So again, we know that ending poverty does require this movement and that building a movement actually takes a really long time um, and, and a lot of energy. And we know that there are stages to any successful movement and we're really in this early stage, a critical one of developing and, and cultivating leaders. Um, and the Speakers Bureau is one of the ways that, as uh, Willie Baptist will say, we pan for gold and look for some of those leaders um, and help to cultivate their leadership. And so the Food Bank is just one kind of small piece of this larger movement to end poverty. Um, and there are a lot of groups working on this. So Randy and I just kind of continue to uh, develop our analysis with the support of Alicia and others that are connected with these organizations. Um, and kind of weave that into our work and into the organization, which is, of course, a slow process, but is something we continue to work on. Great. Thank you all so much. So um, I want to open up the conversation for some Q&A uh, from our participants. Thank you to those who've been sending in some questions or some clarifications. Um, we'll get to as many as we can in the next about 10 minutes. Um, and if anything continues to come up, feel free to use either the Q&A box or the chat box. And I'll just feed them out to Lindsay and Randy and Alicia. Um, but so to begin with, um, there were several questions about funding, of course, that's always a question on our minds, right? So folks wanted to know um, uh, how funding changed, if at all. And let me get the wording on this question. Yeah, so um, 
One participant was interested in how did starting the Speakers Bureau and doing more root cause and policy advocacy work affect your ability to find funding and affect your funding sources? Did your funding sources change? How do funders react to you talking about the goal of um, putting yourself out of business, right, by ending hunger and poverty? So can y'all talk a little bit about what that was like? Sure. <laughs> um, we have a strange budgeting process here that if stuff gets in the budget, we get to do it. And then we try to find money to fill in fill, to do it. Uh, so it's prioritized in our own internal budget that every year we try to, to budget for one session. It's actually not a super expensive program. It's kind of crazy. We kind of say it's about a thousand dollars per person. And that's mostly because of the graduation and we give them all hundred dollar gift cards and food and you know, we video it and all that. What has happened is we've had funders come to the graduation and they're literally like pulling out their checkbook. They're like, I want to do this. And the graduation itself and people hearing people's stories, um, some of them kind of address root causes, some don't. Um, so we're, sometimes we're not as super explicit, especially if the group, you know, it's, it's so new. We've only been meeting for a couple months. We haven't gotten this far in the analysis with the group. Um, but there's never been an issue um, with with trying to find people to pay for it. Everybody's like lining up and wants it in their community. So it's it's been it goes pretty well. I mean, in the scope of our whole budget here, it's such a it's a it's a drop in the bucket, and it's one of the best things I think we've become known for here. And our you know our board members come to graduations. So they like, this is the best thing we've ever done. Um, so there's a lot of support for it. We haven't really pushed the envelope in, in ways that we could, I think, in terms of like rocking the boat that might come farther down the road um, in terms of kind of alienating funders. Um, so I hope that partly answers your question. I hope you have anything. To yeah, yeah, I would add that um, the way as we, you know, we have conversations um, at least once a quarter, probably um, Randy, Alicia, myself, and sometimes Natasha, where we're talking about where's the, what's the direction of the Speakers Bureau? What are we doing? You know, we're constantly reanalyzing. And recently we've been talking about sort of this two pronged approach or like two possibilities of what the Speakers Bureau may evolve into. And the one, the first is folks graduate and they, um, do some speaking gigs and they also are interviewed for like our newsletter and our um, fundraising letters actually. So our development team actually gets a lot out of this. And so that's kind of the, um, the charity side, right, of what the Speakers Bureau could look like. And then the other is the justice side where um, folks can be actually working together to create change um, in the community, in the country, you know, potentially getting, um, some of them have gotten involved with the campaign, things like that. So uh, we sort of do, it's sort of like the two feet where we do both of those almost at the same time. And then, um, so so it's, it's this strange thing where um, it's actually probably helping us make a lot of money in some ways too, you know? Great, thank you. Um, on a little bit of a different note, some folks are asking questions about the political education you mentioned as a part of the speaker theory, sort of what that is for folks who on the phone who might not be familiar, what it looks like, and how you're using it in the context of the speaker theory. Yeah, so um, I could maybe say a little bit, and Alicia, if you want to pop in, or Randy. Um, we found that it's really important to um, look at different resources together. So political education or popular education, right, means that we're analyzing our socioeconomic system and talking together about um, how people's individual experiences relate to the broader picture and what problems we see and how they might be changed. So um, ways that we've done that in the past with Kairos and University of the Poor, which is one of the main things that political education is one of the main things that those groups focus on, is um, looking at things like that political cartoon that was earlier on in the slides that has a bunch of different feet um, of different folks of different races. And it says, what worries me, senators, they're getting into step. And um, it was from during that time of the original Poor People's Campaign. And um, so analyzing a, uh, a work like that, reading something together, watching something together, what we did, the first thing we did with this cohort was um, 
listening to testimonies that were collected through the Poor People's Campaign of people's experiences with the four evils. Um, and then we went around in a circle with the Speakers Bureau and said, how does your experience relate to what you saw in the video? And to build those connections in people's minds. Um, so I'll let Alicia or Randy, if you want to add anything there. I think you've said great stuff. And I would just add, somebody asked in the Q&A bar about um, does this involve consciousness raising? And this, I think, builds very directly on um, the work of Paulo Freire and of Miles Horton and Septa McClark from the Highlander Center and others who have done political education in, in engagement and, uh, you know, in um, direct connection with social movements. Um, you know, this, this kind of consciousness raising process is happening at a bunch of levels. And one of them is, is obviously our own, right? And so we are constantly studying, um, noticing the things that you noticing the ways that our own education is limited, needing to go back and study history and really understand, um, you know, learn more about consciousness raising and social movements um, and about the economy ourselves. And then also, of course, the, the consciousness raising and political education work that happens with the Speakers Bureau. Um, so, so yes, aff affirmative around consciousness raising. And um, maybe there's just a little more to say there, which is that we have a, one of the resources we link to is an article um, documenting the, the work um, that we've done actually in relation with also Semithika College students around um, kind of looking at this process as an action research project. And so you can link to that from the slides also. I guess I would just add yeah. a, oh, sorry, a resource in our um, Poverty 101 workshop that's really simple and impactful. It's through um, United for a Fair Economy. They have a bunch, if you just Google them and they have a bunch of different curriculum and, and workbooks you can download. There's an activity called the 10 Chairs that demonstrates how income inequality has shifted from World War II to the present. And you actually line up 10 chairs and you get 10 people. And in the first part of the simulation, everybody has like one chair and maybe one, like everybody has like a three fourths of a chair and one person has three chairs. And then over time, one person gets nine chairs and then the other nine people have to just try to sit on one chair. And we share some data with that. And then we have a conversation. Well, what's the narrative around all the nine people trying to get in that one chair? And it's like, oh, they're lazy or they're not trying hard enough or they're having kids to get welfare and all that stuff. But then people start to say, but that, yeah, that's not true because we only have one chair. Uh, <laughs> that's a really great resource I just wanted to share. Great. And I know folks are asking um, if, you know, about reiterating some of these uh, resources that Randy and Lindsay and Alicia are sharing and I'll make sure they go out in your follow-up email so if you didn't catch every name or every resource um, I'm happy to share that with you all um, in a follow-up email so we don't have a ton of time left but there's sort of three buckets of questions that I feel like we have left to answer and we can do that if we're strategic and invite you all to continue to stay in touch with us after I'll share a slide with our contact info. Um, but the, the first question, and I think this is related to the political education, but folks are wondering how um, addressing systemic racism and white supremacy culture shows up in that curriculum and as you're talking about um, the political education you're doing with the Speakers Bureau. I know that you mentioned the racial wealth gap simulation and we've got someone from Bread for the World on the call today, Hi Bread for the World, um, which I know addresses um, systemic racism very specifically, but I'm wondering if, if that shows up, and some folks on the phone are wondering if that shows up in any other ways in your political education. Yeah, I would say that racism is, is the topic that we've actually struggled the most to address um, well in the curriculum. And the racial wealth gap simulation has been a nice resource. We've actually only done that with our management team. We haven't done that with the Speakers Bureau yet. Um, and so it's something that we talk about, we talked about through the narrative change stuff with Center for Story-Based Strategy a little bit, um, but it's something that we actually, it's an area of growth for us, I would say. And we did have um, a workshop in uh, Binghamton last year on, on poverty and race that we offered for some people. It's been very challenging because, you know, we do bring back, uh, low-income people together that are white and not white, people of color, 
And it's, it's, we've, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging conversation as a low-income white person to learn more about structural racism and poverty. And we've had some issues where some of our white participants were feeling like they were getting blamed because they have all this privilege. So we are also looking for advice on how to navigate that conversation. It's something we've been thinking about a long time. We've had a couple of our white speakers bureau graduates actually get really triggered by those conversations and kind of disengage at points because they felt like we were blaming them. So we do not have a clear answer on that. Great, thank you. Um, and you all know BMP um, is really interested in continuing to engage on questions of racial equity in our sector and in the world. So um, let's stay in, in communication for folks on the, on the uh, chat who are asking about that. Um, the, the second question is folks have some really practical questions about the Speakers Bureau. So questions about like staffing and capacity, what was needed in terms of resources, um, how often uh, the cohort meets after graduation, whether or not childcare is provided. Is there a place where you have all of that written down? Maybe yes. we can share that. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's all in one spot, but this is a great uh, segue that we have received so many requests for information with those exact same questions that we were literally spending a couple hours a week kind of consulting with people on the phone across the country, um, answering all these, these sorts of questions. So um, actually, it's been a year ago now, I, can, I started taking a, uh, keeping a list of everybody that had contacted us or had started similar programs, and we got together and launched this kind of informal client and constituent engagement community of practice. We have bi-monthly calls. We have a Google Drive where everybody's uploading their resources. So we do have most of our curriculum resources up there. Um, just really quickly, we do provide, we do um, ensure that people do get stipends when they're out and speaking, and either it comes from us or the group that they're speaking to. Um, but this isn't something anybody wants to jump into lightly. It's, it does take time and energy and mental load on us. Um, so um, we can share the, the if, if, I don't know if it's easier for folks to just email me or if I'm Noelle, you can put the link in the, the email to go out, but we can share the Google Doc or the Google Drive with everybody. And there's dozens of organizations that have put their resources in there. We have a Google group as well where people can just put questions out to, I think there's about 60 or 70 people already on it that are interested in this work so we can kind of learn together. And there's organizations involved in that group that aren't emergency food organizations, mm -hmm. so it's all kinds. Right. Um, so I think that's a great segue actually into our, our next slide about um, additional resources. I know we didn't get to all the questions. I wish we could, um, but we are available by email and there are other ways you can reach us if you want to continue this conversation. But want to make sure that folks um, get to hear about some of these additional resources. Yeah, um, as I just mentioned, the community practice, and this is Alicia's paper that I think just went live this week. I'm not sure. Um, it is behind a paywall, but there is a paper out there if you can have access to that. I did want to give a plug for the Closing the Hunger Gap Conference. Um, our food bank is on the leadership team of this group. I, I call us kind of the rabble rousers of food banks, or the radicals. This will be the fourth conference where there really wasn't a space to talk about systemic issues at the traditional food banking conferences. So this group has come together to actually look at root causes of hunger. So the upcoming conference is in September in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I highly encourage folks to attend. It can be really revolutionary for your own work. There's um, three of the books that were on Alicia's slide that we recommend, the Center for Story-Based Strategy and then the Racial Wealth Gap Simulation, um, are all great tools. And obviously the Poor People's Campaign, that's like the umbrella. Great, thanks. And um, for folks who are interested, uh, BNP did a, a tool to engage webinar actually on the racial um, wealth gap simulation and sort of how, how that came into being and how different organizations are using that. Um, and so if you're interested in that, we've got the recording and the slides here on tools to engage.org as well as the recording and slides from all of the other webinars that are in this series. There's also a great one we recently did um, looking at the connection between a, um, an organizing group and a service delivery group and really addressing this question of like the bootstrap narrative that Lindsay mentioned during the lessons learned section. So I recommend that as well. Um, and Tools to Engage.org also has over 100 resources from across the social sector, not just EMP's work. Um, for folks who are interested in these questions of constituent engagement, 
and um, service and social change, and they include some of the, the tools that you see here on the left hand side of your screen. So check out tools to engage.org. There's a ton more there for you. Um, and as I said, please stay in touch. Um, you've got our social media and our uh, websites here. Again, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the slides and the recording and as many of the resources that were mentioned during this hour as I possibly can. And um, if you've got any questions or follow-up, my email is down at the bottom here. Um, and I'm happy to connect you with Alicia or Randy or Lindsay. Um, and we'll also share out that information that Randy just mentioned about sort of the nuts and bolts of the Speakers Bureau, because I know that's that's really interesting and exciting to folks. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much again to the three of you. Thanks for your time and for your work. We really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for being on the call. And we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.